Good afternoon and welcome to all of you who are joining us here today. My name is Therese Schumann de Magnusson and I'm the director of the Nordic Africa Institute. For the past 60 years, we have, together with our partners, identified issues and performed high quality research on relevant societal challenges in Africa. We see ourselves as a knowledge hub for collaborative research, communication, and documentation, aiming to support a deeper understanding of contemporary African perspectives. Our approach is to always co-create knowledge together with partners, with stakeholders, with target audiences, both in African as well as Nordic context, and also to contribute always with in-depth, contextualized, and informed, empirically driven scholarship. Underpinning this strategic role is an emphasis on people and values, all which lies at the very heart of what we do. And through this work, we help to inform the, the policy and decision makers in the Nordic region, both of challenges, but also opportunities in African countries. The Nordic Africa Institute and the AEGIS Collaborative Research Group on African Urban Dynamics welcomes you to this double book launch today. It presents two titles. The first is Living for the City, Social Change and Knowledge Production in the Central African Copper Belt by Professor Miles Larmer of the University of Oxford. And the second title, There Used to Be Order, Life After the Privatization of the Sambia Consolidator Copper Mines by my colleague, Dr. Patience Mususa of the African, Nordic Africa Institute. These two books set in Africa's copper belt brings a newest understanding of the social, political, economic, but also historical dynamics that has shaped them. Africa's copper belt is not just contributing to the electrification and industrialization of the global economy through its supply of copper and cobalt. It is also a region where lived realities and aspirations of its populations intersect with the mining community. Centering social history and stories of place these two books provide an account of economic and cultural life in the region. So why is this important? Well, if we are to aim to address the, both the UN and the African Union's development goals and aspirations of, for example, equality, social justice, and social sustainable management of natural resources, then rich contextual knowledge of the places within which we aim to achieve a positive impact is essential. I very much look forward to the discussions that we will be having this afternoon, and it is now my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Professor Eleanor Fisher, Head of Research at the Nordic Africa Institute, who will be the chair of the seminar. Thank over you to you, Eleanor. Much. Thank you very much, Therese. I'm the head of research at the Nordic Africa Institute. And before I introduce our scholars um, and their book presentations alongside our discussants, I thought it might be helpful for me to set the scene very briefly on the region that we're talking about, for those of you who maybe are not so familiar with it. The Central African Copper Belt um, the geology of the region has been the centre since colonial times, post-colonial times, however you want to characterise these eras, of industrial mining. And alongside the industrial mining has come social change into the area, the building of cities, and the mining towns which have been the legacy of the mining. Alongside that, it has also been the centre of knowledge production, particularly in my own 
fields, anthropology, the related disciplines of history, political science, geography, etc. Um, particularly traditions of social research that where we've had fantastic scholarship coming from the region. And I think this is very important to, to understand contextually. So traditions of, of thought and scholarship on urbanization, on social change in the individual, on class formation, on labor movements, on ethnicity, and also differences in knowledge production across borders. So within the Zambian Copper Belt, for example, a particular focus on cosmopolitanism and how it has been an ethnic, ethnic melting pot of people coming together. And then over the border in the York Katanga region of today's DRC, how that has been a melting pot for ethnic conflict and scholarly traditions looking and researching on the dynamics that take place in these regions. And this is the, the location for the studies today and the traditions within which they're working with, which have really had very important ramifications over the years, also spanning colonial and post-colonial times, which brings contentious debates around scholarship to the fore. So, just a little background um, on the location we're talking about, both geographically, but also in terms of knowledge and knowledge production. On that note, I'd like to turn and introduce our panel today. Firstly, Professor Miles Lama, very pleased to welcome you to the Nordic Africa Institute. Miles is a historian on labour and economic history of Southern Central Africa a member of the history faculty at the University of Oxford and director of the African Studies Centre, bringing his book, of course, as Therese has introduced, Living for the City, Social Change and Knowledge Production in the Central African Copper Belt. And this is an interlinked historical and comparative study of both Copper Belts, which is why it is particularly unique, because this rarely happens. Um, in the DRC, Congo, and in Zambia. So a unique perspective on the region. Professor Lama has also written extensively on social and political change, labor and social movements, extracted communities, military conflict, and Africa's Cold War. On my side also, Dr. Patience Masusa, um, a close colleague of myself at the Nordic Africa Institute, um, an anthropologist, but with an architectural background, which brings an interesting mix to her scholarship. Um, her book, There Used to Be Order, Life on the Copper Belt After the Privatization of the Zambia Consolidated Copper Mines, provides an ethnographic account of the middle income decline in an African context that has resonances to global experiences of post-industrialization <clears throat> in decline. Patience also studies the politics of sustainability in urban Africa. Then, turning to our discussants, who I'm delighted to welcome here in person today, Professor Karen Tramberg Hansen is a renowned social cultural anthropologist whose work main, focuses mainly on Zambia, covering fields in urban anthropology, political economy, economic anthropology, and consumption and material culture. She's taught in the Department of Anthropology and African Studies at Northwestern University from 1982 to 2012, when she retired. And her research interests are focused on informal urban economy, domesticity, and domestic service, youth and consumption. Last but not least, <laughs> Dr. Stephen Ma is a political scientist and senior lecturer in peace and conflict studies in the Department of Global Political Sciences at Malmö University. He's also an executive board member of the Institute of Urban Research at Malmö University and co-founder of the Aegis Collaborative Group on African Urban Dynamics. Also, I would say a close friend of mine, so it's very nice to welcome you all here today. Without further ado, Miles, could I please turn to you to give a little, little insight into your book? I'm um, okay. I, 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 
I, I, I believe that Professor Tambak Hansen is going to speak, we'll speak first, first. And, okay. and, and no, then I will respond to we'll her comments. Sorry, Karen, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. I am happy to be part of this discussion uh, of, of two books that, in fact, uh, although different, complement one another uh, with Lama's comprehensive sweep across 70 years of Copper Belt history, opening a kind of picture window uh, into Mususa's detailed ethnography of recent efforts by retrenched miners on um, mine workers and their families to make a living in very trying times. The two books do share several elements. They both highlight the uneven and varied nature of urban work, and they focus largely on the skilled segments of the adult population. When explaining the limits of scholarship from the post-World War II period and on, they both juxtapose the social categories of urban and modern to local residents' popular notions of myth and nostalgia for the way back when, during the days of corporate welfareism enjoyed by mine workers and their families. Precisely when that was always changes the when, depending on whose narratives we listen to. Both books emphasize that the experiences these terms uh, feature do not exclude one another. Rather, they coexist in conflict or accommodation in processes of knowledge production by multiple actors. In short, these juxtapositions are fugitive and therefore troublesome or challenging for a categorical social scientific mindset, as well as for the people who experience them. One of the reasons why women's income-oriented activities had not been studied in detail on the Copper Belt, as well as in Rosarka, even though, quote, everybody knew about them, uh, has to do, as Lama notes, with the widespread social science urban bias and I would add a general lack of analytical tools to capture this work. The urban bias of the 70s and early 80s held that resources were diverted away from the agricultural sector to urban areas. This entailed a severe rural urban income gap. Development policy in those days rarely focused on urban areas and development organizations weren't keen at all on entering the urban townships where disorganization and unruly behavior were assumed to be widespread. Growing over urbanization was held to produce saturated urban labor markets, unemployment, and what was then awkwardly referred to as underemployment. Behind these assumptions was an outdated wage labor model, according to which work eventually would shape up as it ought to, namely into proper wage employment. This all changed in the early 70s, when social anthropologist Key Hart in urban research in Ghana used the term informal for widespread income opportunities from work that wasn't formally contracted. Immediately, the International Labor Organization and Development Organizations picked up the term. During subsequent years, the social science uh, scholarship has come to see such activities as shaping urban livelihoods throughout the economy, not just an informal sector. One formulation, uh, another formulation included the notion of a real economy that was part of the title of anthropologist Janet McGaffey's 1991 book about the contribution of smuggling and unofficial activities to national wealth in Zaire. Francophone scholarship in Western Central Africa has a spectacular term for these activities, the system D, le système de débrouillement, a formulation that captures the makeshift nature of many such activities of living by your wits, being savvy, resourceful, and creative when the economy is a disaster. In fact, the system D shares some of the characteristics Nususa attributes to diverse efforts of trying by Luanza residents when she talks about people tuning in to possibilities and constraints and of being movies. As we learn in these two books, aside from employment in mines, 
Cabobel residents have always pursued many different and overlapping activities depending on the kind of resources they can claim and the situation at hand. Through these processes, the social organization of everyday life in Cabo Bell towns has taken various forms that challenge our comprehension of people's ever shifting struggles to capture in the to, that is captured in these authors' notions of trying and living for the city. Let me turn now to some of the differences between the two books. Since the early 90s, Lama has worked on and off in the Cabo Belt region. His latest book, as we just heard, is inspired by a, a collective research project that examined uh, urban developments on the two sides of the Copper Belt. Generations of observers, Lama, sorry, generations of research, researchers, Lama observes, operated under the shadow of methodological nationalism. Sounds like a disease. Let me <laughs> add that many also operated with linguistic parochialism, lacking fluency in both French and English. Lama's skills in political analysis are evident in this book's focus on labor unions and nationalism. The book also includes observations not highlighted in the project book. Among them, the chapter on gendering the copper belt and the chapter on popular culture with examples from music, song, and painting. I really, Lama, enjoyed the discussion of ethnomusicologist Hugh Tracy's time in Northern Rhodesia and the Copper Belt during the 50s and his work recording, if not constructing, African folk music for his International Library of African Music. I also really appreciated the discussion of the influence of Zambian Kalandula style and sound on Congolese Europa. In fact, Zambia Zaire music cross currents invite much future attention. The last chapter with observations not covered in the project book concerns vital issues about the environment. It casts much needed light on the hidden legacy of mine pollution and more recent concerns with environmental protection. Throughout his book, Lama compares developments across the two couple worlds, identifying commonalities in company provided welfare and services to mine workers and their families and urban areas laid out in space with separate housing for miners and other workers. He also points out major differences, as we just heard, in particular, the authoritarian paternal attitudes for the Katanga mining companies applied to managing their workers and families, the suppression of political association that made ethnic backgrounds dominate rather than collective action, and the adverse effects of all of this on the region's political and economic development after independence in 1960. By contrast, in northern Rhodesia, social welfare on the mines developed as a result of both industrial and mine worker actions through unions, and it influenced the emergence of a multi ethnic African nationalism. Mususa then brings her background in architecture into play as she enters Luanza in 2007. She walks and talks us through Luanza, emphasizing movement. Walking the city as a temporal process is also a mapping exercise as well as an exploration of urban geography and the built environment. Using standard ethnographic research practice, she engages in everyday life along with residents as they move about town. In fact, she writes herself into the book's narrative using her purchase and renovation of a house as a platform for discussing the significance of a house of one's own to efforts at making a living. The low density township that forms the setting for many of her observations became a residential area for skilled Zambian mine workers just before independence in 64, after previously housing expatriate miners' families. Then in 1997, a presidential decree enacted the sale of parastatal and council housing to sitting tenants. How tenants lied, I don't know, but uh, anyway, it's a funny <laughs> term. During the massive economic decline between 97 and 2003, many Copper Belt residents got their house as part of their retrenchment package. Mususa describes in some detail how the house and its yard helped sustain livelihoods as residents grew vegetables, raised chicken or fish, built contemporaries, small kiosks, 
along the road to sell basic commodities and homemade snacks. Hairdressers, tailors, second-hand clothing vendors, and others, including squatters, moved into backyards and empty spaces. Some cultivated gardens or fields in the peri-urban areas, and some had farms. She also explored the work of women and children on local copper mine dumps and in the new copper belt that was developing in the northwestern province. Through illegal and arduous work, they retrieved flux, stone, and copper ore, adding commodity value to formerly considered waste products that found eager buyers because of rising copper prices and widespread construction. Her account demonstrates that in those days, you might have lots of aspirations hinting at lives yet to come, but you couldn't really plan. Living became a series of improvisations entailing new moralities to justify and explain activities that fall beyond what is legal in a formal sense. The suffering also affected gender relations, forms of sociality and mutual support, giving rise to nostalgic sentiments about the past and the time and place where you knew what to expect of relationships by gender and generation, and that occasionally attributed a village-like atmosphere to urban life. Perhaps this notion of villagization is yet another twist on myths and nostalgias about better lives and times. And much like Lama, Mususa dedicates a chapter to gender constructions and includes a discussion of how popular music makes sense of the disruptive rhythms of life, evoking different pathways to explore the world to make life out of disorder just trying. So today we have a wonderful double launch of books about African urban settings. On a global scale, policymakers and planners have recently been forced to reckon with urban settings as critical to future sustainability, in part because of explosive population growth, especially in cities in the South, like countries as Zambia and the DRC. In 2015, for the first time ever, cities and communities were added to the UN Development Goals, now known as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The 2030 overall target for development goal number 11 is to develop sustainable cities and communities with a focus on inclusivity, adequate, safe, and affordable housing, basic services, slum upgrading, and much else besides. Lama's book ends with a research engagement with sustainability in his exploration of the environmental effects of mining. Mususa's book also points to the urgency of future research into the dangers of people's interaction with mining waste. In effect, many new and constructive research agendas are likely to follow the inclusion of cities among the UN Sustainable Development Goals and of the publication of these two books. Oh, thank you very much for a very nice set of perceptive comments on the books. Before I turn to our second discussant, Stephen, could I please urge our audience to pose questions in the Q&A function, which I will pick up here on my device and I can put in a little while to our authors. Thank you. Can I please turn to you, Steve? Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, th thanks so much. And I'm really happy to, to be here. Um, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation from Nai and from Patient, uh, not least for which uh, this is the first time I've been anywhere in two years. So I'm, I'm really, it's all very exciting. And so, but it's also exciting because I just want to say at the onset that these books are great. Um, and uh, that, that both individually, of course, but, but reading them together and side by side, by side they, they provide a comprehensive, grounded uh, history of the past and present, while also you know, pointing us, I think, in some directions for where we might go, uh, where, where, where things might develop and turn um, in, the, in the years ahead. Um, I don't want to sort of recast the, 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 the summary, but I do want to sort of maybe offer one, uh, one or two introductory points about Patience's book and then, and then Miles. Um, so in Patience's book, There Used to Be Order, she presents a sensitive, sympathetic, moving portrait 
portrait of the lives of residents uh, in the Copper Belt's uh, urban margins, uh, who make a go of things to try and construct lives that, that work in some way for, for them, for their families, and their, for their communities. And, Throughout this book, we follow the lives of these individuals. Uh, we meet uh, Mr. Mobita, Mr. Mwale. Uh, we meet patients herself. Well, I learned all sorts of interesting things about uh, about the kinds of uh, things that you were doing in the uh, the Copper Belt that 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 you yourself are a character in some ways in this uh, uh, in this story. And that the people in this book, you know, they sometimes succeed, they sometimes fail, but they most always end up at some destination or outcome unexpected and unanticipated. Um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, these people are always trying to sort of borrow uh, the word that, 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 that you use. And the readers are presented with a, with a narrative that's steeped in hope and dignity, um, even if, as you read it, it feels a bit melancholy at times. Um, that, uh, in, you know, but, but, we, but we see individuals who, uh, to paraphrase Marshall Berman, um, are trying to make a make themselves a home in the maelstrom of modernity. Um, and that, uh, you know, it, and, and for me, it reads like a novel in like the best possible way. Um, and so in, in Living for the City by, by Miles Larmer is an equally attuned and sympathetic portrayal of the, of the lives and, and, and perspectives of people who have been, you know, who have experienced the, the, the growth of the Copper Belt, the boom times, the bus times, um, and, and, and everything in, in between. But at the same time, the scope of the book is 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 really vast, and and it's full of rich detail, and it and, and it spans nearly a century. And we're presented at different points on discussions of popular culture, uh, labor history. Um, we see sort of these narratives of the boom and busts, and and towards the end, the 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 sort of the, the environmental destruction of these of these areas. Um, and you know, and, and for me, like the 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 synthesis of all of this is really sort of just really inspiring to read, just trying to sort of put together um, all of this material. And so in both books obviously are focused on the cases at hand and then the lives and then the places and spaces of the Copper Belt and its residents. But 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 these books are also focused, I think, and, and this is where I want to sort of head, and on, on sort of much larger processes of global, um, you know, global uh, political economies, uh, capitalisms, both extractive and neoliberal, both policy and popular narratives of modernization and development, systems of colonialism and imperialism, the cyclicality of booms and busts and perhaps booms again. Um, and so we see within like these granular sort of particularities of the lives of the people that we're introduced to, um, you know, that that these 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 grounded moments are, are inextricably linked with like these larger structural um, and ideological forces that 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 are sort of external to, to these locations. You know that that in some place in, in some way we might say that these places might be in, in some ways perhaps marginal to the functioning of global capitalism, but the legacies and the impact and the destructive imprints of uh, of of these of these sort of forces on the people and environments. You know I, I would say sort of makes them central to the telling of global capitalism story, um, which is why, for example, reading the accounts of, of trying, for instance, and Patience's book was for me you know, like a bit sad because it's it, it, on the one hand, it is like you have like dignity is ever present throughout like the dignity and in, in, in the efforts that these people it's sort of take to make their lives work, but in a context in which like they're they're sort of operating in a context that where, where they're dealing with things like so far out of their control that they that you know that it seems like this this, this struggle even as things happen it seems perhaps like strangely futile in 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 some ways and so you know like reading this like what can happen across a, a lifetime or across generations um you know if we were to come back to to these locations 20 30 50 years from now you know what would we see would we with this book you know with the story still, you know still be the same and i wonder you know and that might be something interesting for for us to hear from from both you and miles about like where where do we head uh you know going forward um you know but, and this is, I think, why both of these books resonated with me so much is like, you, you know, you can't help but ground it in, in the particularities of these cases, but there, you, you can't sort of read them outside of the present moment in which we find ourselves in, right? That sort of, you have all these, you, you know, you're, the book is, the, the, the two books are about crisis in some ways, and perhaps even like multiple crises, um, but sort of looming outside of that is 
sort of like the in in obviously you don't get into this into the uh, to the discussion, but you know there's a like climate change, the pandemic, um, sort of environmental precarity, um, sort of global inequality, and you know now sort of like the the this new looming threat of a wider war in Europe, like, you know, that that we see all these things kind of like they're they're outside, but they're kind of hovering around like the the the, the text. And, you know, as we joked at dinner yesterday, this wasn't quite the future that we signed up for. Um, you know. and, and so but in that sense, though, these books have so much, I think, to teach us about about elsewhere, but you know, we learn about the copper belt, but we learn about other places as well. And so in a, in a someone who works in this Kind of comparative urbanism field, you know, and, and, and I work on, on Detroit, sort of vis a vis Afri other African cities, you know, that's kind of how I approach these books. And so, what, what I thought I would do in the last, you know, seven minutes or so that I have is kind of then lift these books up into a larger uh, comparative conversation. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and I won't sort of get into the huge detail. And obviously, these comparisons aren't one to one. And just, but I just want to point like a, a, out a, a few things, and, and maybe we can discuss this uh, uh, in the in the Q and A or, or uh, later on. But you know, but I undertake sort of, you know, I, I kind of operate in the spirit of, uh, you know, thinking about cross-regional comparisons and the spirit of, of, of Abdul Malik Simone, um, you know, his call a decade ago to invent shared latitudes and longitudes across far-flung places. And by doing so, we can gain sort of insight into common practices, uh, processes, characteristics of contemporary urbanism, uh, globalized neoliberal capitalisms, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, but if we want to think of the of kind of the comparative perspective or the lens uh, between, say, a place like Detroit and the Copper Belt, you know, what might these places have in common? Um, you know, the the recent histories of Detroit and and the Copper Belt, I think, reflect stories of of of, of late or, or neoliberal capitalism in which, if I might quote from the from the Komarovs, you know, writing about theorizing from the South, in which the history of the present reveals itself most starkly, you know, in the in the antipodes. So like what is what does this mean, right? So so places like Detroit, you know, once um, you, you know, I won't get into too much detail here, but once uh, you know, sort of known as the arsenal of democracy during the, the Second World War, like, you know, it was A and perhaps even B manufacturing hub of uh, mid 20th century industrial capitalism in the US. Um, you know, it, it was a place in which one historian uh, of, of that period sort of described as a total industrial landscape. And it, and, and it was, you know, in, in, in that sort of imagery sort of evokes, I think, some of the, uh, the the descriptions that you guys sort of offer here. Um, is that you know in, but you know so within this is it obviously Detroit is not that anymore. In the same way that the the Copper Belt doesn't sort of fit within sort of the, those 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 golden days, even if they weren't perhaps like so uh, so golden anymore. Um, or or in in reality, is that the city's not that anymore, and the city space and its residents, you know, continue to bear the psychic, the physical scars and and wounds. And I say wounds because some of these injuries have not healed uh, from you know sort of being uh, you know resulting from the time of being at the, the quote unquote apex of American industrial capital. You know, places like Detroit um, and the Copper Belt, as I noted earlier, are now perhaps, you know, marginal to the functionality of global capitalism in some ways, but the presence of the scale of the scope of their crisis, um, you know, perhaps makes them central to the narratives of understanding how, you know, the processes of capitalism like work today. And here they stand perhaps not as exceptions, but as exemplars, and we might even go so far as to say also as warnings. Um, and second, you know, they further share similar experiences of declining government or corporate investment, um, you know, at, at least in terms of, of thinking about, say, like broadly provisioned uh, public infrastructure. You know, and of course, while some parts of Detroit and, and, and similarly in the Copper Belt might be awash in attention or, or resources, most areas are not. And, you know, in this you know, thus we see across these locations, you know, extreme, you know, levels of poverty. Um, you know, the enduring sort of legacies of failing or decaying or absent infrastructures. 
And, and here it should be noted as, as Patience's discussion of trying throughout her book. And I think, you know, Miles makes this, a similar point, you know, when he's discussing the, the period of decline and state weakness and failure and poverty, you know, people are forced to respond to and cope with infrastructure failure, you know, on their own terms, successfully or not. Um, but they're supposed to just figure it out. And, you know, but this outcome, you know, is, is reframed under capitalism as something perhaps almost heroic. Um, you know, it's about independence. It's about individuality. It's about self-sufficiency. And I think, Miles, if, if my memory is right, like at one point, you, you sort of say that, you know, that the idea of urban modernity in the copper belt today has been recast in some ways to kind of reflect this, right? That to reflect these conditions that, you know, this emphasis on individuality and, 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 and self-sufficiency is, 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 is a good thing something that good citizens do. So, you know, so instead of being circumstances, say, that we might criticize as a form of structural violence, um, they become, you know, just simply, this is, yeah, this is what you do to be a good sort of urban modern citizen, you know, and this, of course, tracks with mythologies of self-sufficiency and, you know, pull your, pull yourself up by your bootstrap narratives, um, you know, that we see sort of, you know, in mythologies in American capitalism. And so it's interesting, I think, to compare, um, you know, the, how the logics or the rationalities or the motivations of capitalism, they remain, you know, quite starkly similar um, across like these, the, uh, across these locations. Um, maybe one or two, just one quick final point is that, you know, finally and connected to the preceding point is that most folks in Detroit and in the Copper Belt, you know, obviously have to make do in these precarious urban environments and institutional economic spatial frameworks in which they find themselves, you know, they, they go it alone as a matter of necessity without you know much financial or, or technological support you know people in detroit in the copper belt they must you know they sort out issues of urban agriculture of uh, of, of food security of water scarcity of of um you know contamination um you know like they're, they're they're asked to solve these problems on their own and of course this last point is sent is a central theme of patience's book and perhaps you know it, but, but miles like, i mean this is this is a recurrent theme in, in yours as well um that try and getting by um, patients uses the word like wayfaring, which I think is a really sort of evocative phrase for thinking about like how people move. Um, you know, they like you know the, the, they they wayfare through these urban spaces and relationships, both strange and familiar. They 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 try to accumulate loose ends that are sort of out there to connect different threads together to try to sort of make things um, something anything you know happen. Um, you know, and and that this constitutes a, a, a central sort of point of life in the Copper Belt and in Detroit. And that fundamentally these skills represent a form of expertise um, at acting in precarious circumstances and times that, at, you know, in expertise in calculating risk at, at kind of knowing when we should when when it's when it's when it's appropriate to act and when it's not, um, you know when when we should hold back. And that these skill sets are often ignored or marginalized, but they remain, you know, really important. And that you know, on the one hand, they might sort of represent alternative approaches to infrastructure provision, provision or, or urban planning um, in the locations in which they're practiced. And 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 that would be. And this is something that patients and I have been working with before and it would be interesting to hear kind of what you what you miles but also patients um you know think about you know what this might mean and how this might be might be done um and uh, do i have do i have time one minute. one minute all right good enough it's, uh, but at, but at the same time and this is something you know that again that we've been working with uh previously you know is to what extent might these sort of practices um you know what 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 might these locations and sort of like tactics and strategies, you know, how might sort of locations say like in Sweden, for example, what what might, what can we learn from these things? Um, you know, are these strategies, are these practices, um, are they transferable? And if so, how? I mean, it's one thing I think, you know, it, it's one thing to say that we should learn from the South, but, but to actually sort of implement that in practice. Um, becomes like a very complicated, tricky thing. Like what can be adapted? What, what, what can travel? What cannot? And how do you sort of mediate that in these different um, contexts? And I think that would be like one, uh, one additional question. I think that would be interesting to hear, um, you know, from, from you guys. And so I'll stop there right on time, actually. So I'm Thank happy. you yeah. very much, Stephen. I think a, a further, very rich reflection to, to, to Karen's um, and also bringing in your knowledge of Detroit, which I, I think is, 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 
nice to bring that into bear in the conversation. And Miles, can I please turn to you this time correctly? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And, and thank you for, to NAI for the invitation. And, and thank you to both of you for reading and engaging with both our work so seriously. It's a, it's a real honor and privilege. Um, to raise in her introductory remarks, uh, emphasize the co-production of knowledge. And it's certainly something which I have, I think, belatedly learned to understand. The Cop About has been a place written about by generations of historians and social scientists and, and researchers, but it's also fundamentally a place which is the communities of the Cop About have consistently um, produced their own understandings, their own knowledge of their own societies, um, which have both been distinct from, but also uh, in discussion with uh, social scientific knowledge produced from without historically by the West, but also by African universities uh, and universities in the region. That knowledge was itself um, in many ways reflective, more reflective of those societies. Cop about residents sought to influence the social scientific knowledge produced about them for uh, reasons to do with their own sense of identity, but also to tactically seek to influence the policies that were adopted by donors, by governments, by policymakers, by international finance institutions about these societies. So there's never been a time when that co-production of knowledge wasn't at work, but the particular forms that it took have changed in different kinds of periods. And that for me is something which I've sort of tried to build into my work as I've, as I've been taught by many now, uh, uh, over a 30 year period of cop about residents about how to think about this place. So that's, you know, that's been really, really important to, to what I've done. I think probably a key um, uh, aspect of uh, that I would draw from Karen's um, comments is that notion of formality and informality. You know, one of the key ways that the cop about was framed as with spaces like Detroit, uh, and other urban industrial centers in the mid to late 20th century were places where the economy was formal, the economy was industrial, it was also masculine, it was about uh, manufacturing uh, and particular kinds of formality. And yet all the time, informal, what, what Hart characterizes as informal economies were absolutely central to the way that people lived, putting it simply, far larger numbers of copper belt residents were farming for the sale of food for the production of food um, and, and trading than were ever working in mines. The fact that the majority of those people were women meant that that labor was problematized, seen as less important, seen as in many ways less historically modern uh, and therefore marginalized, not just by social scientists, but often by these communities themselves that invested in a vision of urban modernity that stressed the formal, the modern, the cosmopolitan, sometimes then marginalizing certain aspects of their own identity. Did women work? We asked them, no, generally not. But then uh, digging below the surface with our research, we found that the majority of women worked, they traded, they farmed, they were crucial to the economy, they raised families and generated wealth for those families. So a key point I think in is that the work seeks to integrate um, what have been problematized or seen as backward aspects of urban living that are central and, and can be observed everywhere, um, but that have been marginalized in urban social scientific research and are popular visions of what a city looks like. Um, now, I think that is something which we can definitely, in response to, to Steve's question, seek to integrate more fully into how we understand urban industrial spaces more generally to integrate those spaces on a gendered basis more fully, to place the informal as having as much value and historical meaning and, and significance um, as, the, uh, as, as the much better documented and easier to research, mm -hmm. uh, more formal uh, sort of side of the economy here. So that's certainly something I've sought to do. Um, some of that is through quite traditional historical techniques, but um, Karen, I think you're, 
uh, your identification of the popular culture work, you can probably tell that I found that some of the most enjoyable work to, <laughs> yes, to write, yeah. Yeah. read about. Kind of like a different voice. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think I, it's a sort of belated discovery that all this well. work on labour and capital is much more exciting to write about art and painting <laughs> and, uh, and music. Um, and partly because that this is a this is a, a, a an avenue for the effective popular expression of of, of the meanings of these societies. Um, that were was much more widely available. Uh, you, you, large numbers of people lacked uh, strong literacy in English and in written English for much of this period. And so cultural forms provided a great way for people to express history, storytelling, to make claims about the modern, to talk about the contrast between the village and the town, what happened to gender relations, uh, ethnic identities, new forms of urbanization, religious beliefs in the, uh, the melting pot, the crucible, of, of urban modernity. So I think Copper Belt communities have always been doing this. History in this sense is not the abstract, sometimes slightly dull academic uh, version of history, but this is social history for claim making purposes, mm -hmm. to make sense of where we are, where we've been, where we're going, and to make strategic claims on the state, on elite actors uh, to extract resources. And that's a process that's always going on, and that all social scientific or historical researchers, including us, should and, and must be aware of. So I think that's one of the key ways that Copper Belt research and Copper Belt communities can tell us about these things. The Copper Belt may be in what is a paradoxical period because unlike Detroit, the Copper Belt remains hugely important to the global economy. It's going in the future to be one of the places where cobalt is produced that's crucial for clean energy. And on the ground, that means a very dirty industrial process and a highly exploitative, dangerous process. Copper Belt communities then over the last 15, 20 years have grappled and engaged more closely with uh, environmental movements and have generated their own environmental protests. Uh, and I think in the future, we're gonna see Copper Belt communities continue to make sense of their own experience, draw on the history and make claims about the future in relation to uh, global environmental uh, dynamics. Climate change is a, is a real aspect of that. Uh, and trying to ensure through those processes that they don't continue to pay the price mm. for our clean energy. Uh, that, and, and they will use exactly the same strategies repurposed for the 21st century in doing so. I think that patients work, to some extent my work, enable us to understand how those processes have been done, mm. how communities have been created in the creation of their own histories and their own knowledge about their own societies. We are able to make a modest documentation of that. And I think we will see in the future Copper Belt communities draw on exactly this uh, range and portfolio of techniques um, to enable them to, as I say, use their history to make sense of their pride in their society, differentiated as it is across the DRC Zambia border, um, to, 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 to insist that the future uh, perhaps replicates some aspects of that nos slightly nostalgic golden age, that labor standards should be upheld, that environmental standards um, should be insisted upon. And these are communities that we will watch with interest as they continue to organize and make claims about their societies for the future in close integration with the precarious changes in the global capitalist economy. Thank you very much, Miles. Thanks. If I could turn to you, Patience, no. if you'd like to make a response to our discussions. Uh, yes, and, and, and thank you, Karen, and, and, and Stephen and Miles um, for this, this really interesting discussion and for you and and for your very supportive comments on the book, a sort of uh, coming from an architectural background and then entering into the sort of writing uh, writing space, it's always a challenge about where you enter from. And I think this sort of informed um, how I approached the work mm -hmm. and, and the whole idea that there are possibly multiple entry points in being able to tell uh, stories about particular places. And what's been really exciting um, in, uh, in being part of uh, this, co the Comparing Copper Belts project is when we met here in 20, back in December, 2016, it was listening to all the different entry points, you know, mm -hmm. from infrastructure, history, uh, labor and popular culture and, 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 and engaging in, 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 that, in that conversation. And, and for the book, I think, as, as Karen mentioned, I entered 
looking at the copper belt from a spatial uh, perspective. And one of the strongest influences actually was your book, Keeping House in Lusaka. <laughs> and, and it was very much about how, how do we uh, account for people's practical engagement with, with place and, and what they do in, in particular places? And how do we narrate those particular accounts in the context of when you have a radical socioeconomic and political change or disruptions, or when you have booms and busts, things that fluctuate? How do people in the long durée of places that are um, affected by the price of commodities and the market and so experience regular fl fluctuations, how do they cope and make life in a context where they do not have a grasp fully mm -hmm. of the things and the forces that shape their life? So in this context, um, the, the, the book uh, ended responding to uh, an aspect, uh, Karen, actually, I remember keeping house in Osaka on being able to describe the neo, you know, the empirical realities of neoliberalism. What does it mean in, 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 in practice to, to live in this particular space? And what I also was attempting to do was to tell an account that links in that for somebody being able to read it would be able to relate to other places similar like Detroit, um, like post-socialist countries in Eastern, in Eastern Europe that have experienced uh, change, uh, some of it dis disruptive and have had to reconfigure uh, their lives and seeing it more as a continuous process, an iterative process, not as something that is presumed to be taken, but as an improvisational um, a process. And here the work of uh, Tim Ingold, actually, I come from a material anthropology background too, was really highly influential in being able to uh, effectively problematize that idea of fixed agency that uh, somebody makes a decision and then something happens, there's a particular action. But to be able to show how that particular process is effectively interacting with a whole range of other factors, um, people, social relations and ties, the particular economic situation at the time, and what the material environment itself, in particular the landscape and the surface of a place, uh, mining waste, uh, trees with avenues, whether they're there or not, uh, how much of a backyard you have, how far you have to work to a field to grow agriculture work, whether you have running water or not, or you need to dig a well, and, 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 and what, what your social networks have and how you can mobilize them uh, to, uh, to, to work. And, and, I, and I think sort of to respond to, uh, to you, Stephen, in particular about, you know, the sort of sense of melancholy or sort of the futility mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of, of these actions. And if, if one had to ask, well, what might things look like in, in, in 20 years time, you know, and there actually I'm quite hopeful, largely actually sort of relating to your work, Miles, actually your earlier work on sort of um, on labor organization and, and, and political mobilization in these particular contexts that uh, being able to sort of draw also in sort of this, uh, if, if a place could be described as also having a particular political legacy. So if one looks at nostalgia, not just as, you know, some people would problematize it, especially now in the times, as looking back to sort of fixed golden age, but looking at it almost as the repository through which one can also mobilize and pick particular kinds of progressive, I would say, um, uh, lessons to how they might reshape a much more sort of progressive, sustainable, inclusive politics, uh, one that takes into account women's labor uh, in this particular space has always been very uh, 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 present, and to think about how capitalism from the ground mm -hmm. might also be challenged. And so to link into um, the, the discussion about, well, what lessons for places like Sweden mm -hmm. <laughs> or, <laughs> or 
I, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. But I remember when we received this crisis, you know, what to do yeah. in the context of a, of, of a crisis. I remember thinking, um, what you, I, I was thinking, should read more like, what do you do when you might have protracted crisis in the, for a period? What skills might people be able to draw mm -hmm. upon to be able to make a life both in good times and in bad? Thank you very much, Patient. Um, before I turn to the questions that the audience um, have been posing, thank you very much, please add more. Um, I'd like to just start with one myself. Stephen, you referred to Patience as being a character in her book, and it was very interesting for me reading these rich scholarly accounts side by side. I was wondering if you could both, in fact, but Miles, I'll turn to you, reflect on your own positionality. Mm -hmm. You're talking about knowledge production, and I was thinking 50 years time, what will be the reflection coming back to your own uh, work? And you, you start by criticising or pointing to the critiques of the Western gaze, colonial archive, white researchers and male subjects, and then very nicely start the introduction to talk about women on the copper belt and gender. What would be your reflection on your own positionality within this rich tradition? I think I see myself as the latest, certainly not the latest now, because there are many younger, more dynamic, uh, energetic researchers coming after me. But this work stands in a sort of problematic tradition of Western knowledge produced about a region from without. And in some ways, it's very seeks to be alive and attentive to that. What I understand and what I document in the book is generations of uh, African interlocutors, interpreters of various kinds, members of these societies who uh, influenced very profoundly the work of social scientists, sometimes in ways those social scientists understood, sometimes uh, that they barely understood, and that those creative processes were always going on. Africans came to social scientists with an intent to influence their agenda. I think I've usually been aware of that, but working through the historical continuity of that over the last 60 or 70 years has made me much more aware um, that that is what my job is as far as the people I work with is concerned. It's not to write academic text. It's to be, um, it's to be influenced and to take agendas forward. So when uh, individuals make themselves available for interview for me, they're not doing it to help me, they're seeking to put certain agendas and issues and grievances on an international agenda, and I see my job in some ways as being aware of uh, my academic privilege um, in order to, that, that seeks then to find ways of expressing that while also telling what I understand to be truths or accurate narratives about these societies, but I think you know, for me, it makes me very consciously aware and, and in an entirely positive way, as far as I'm concerned, that um, there is this ongoing creative process of knowledge production from these societies in which uh, my job, such as it is, is to make those forms of knowledge available rather than impose my own uh, fixed understanding. That requires a level of flexibility. It, relies, it requires a lot of listening. It requires a lot of understanding of the socio-political processes which are unfolding now when one talks to people about things that are uh, conventionally historical um, but within living memory so i think it, it, that's a sort of it's a sort of discomfort with the conventional role of the historian um, but a discomfort that i think is good to be comfortable about thank you thank you very much and patience you're a woman born and bred on the copper belt and your your book draws the reader in with this personalized story of, of your own history in actual fact. So what's your reflection on your positionality as a, as a scholar on this concept? Uh, thanks, Helena. It's actually a really interesting question. And I, I think I'll turn back to the sort of the context of the Copper Belt that sort of shapes, in a sense, one sort of approach to knowledge and subjectivity. So I guess because it's the Copper Belt has been this melting pot of labor mobility um, for quite a while and knowledge making um, uh, in, in this particular context. The, an, the Copper Belt approach, and I guess sort of myself embedding myself in it, but also stepping back to sort of uh, take a look would be, 
one that sort of sees the borrowing of different disciplinary approaches, uh, mixing sort of methodological approaches, more like tools. And I do a little bit of that in, in, in the book, sort of approaching methodology more like a, a, a toolkit. So in terms of position, um, and in particular sort of relating to this sort of canon of knowledge that's been written by Mayfield, you know, I would see it sort of more as the process of what the anthropologist René Devesh and uh, Francis Nyamjo have mentioned before, as this kind of intercultural border linking, i.e. sort of seeking to, to create a dialogue and, and space while also being uh, critical, but also engaging empathetically and seeing that as sort of that productive space through which one can uh, traverse disciplines and, uh, and also traverse sites and experiences. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to turn to questions from our audience now. We have a, a question from Anne Pitcher, beyond congratulating you for the book. I wanted to pick up on some of Steve's comments and ask what the political implications of decline and precarity in the Copper Belt are. Steve noted Detroit was at one time seen as the heartland of democracy, and yet we almost witnessed the repudiation of democracy during the presidential vote certification process in 2020. What about the copper belt? What political currents were operating there now? Are residents drawn to charismatic representations of authority? Are they seeking to preserve the values articulated earlier by trade unions? Maybe I can turn to you, Miles, and let's try and keep questions a little brief so we can fit them all in. It's a big question. Thank you, Anne. Um, and I'll try and give a small and specific answer. I think that contemporary political currents on the Copper Belt continue to be informed by a sense within their respective nation states, DRC and Zambia, of the value of this resource, mineral production, and the relative poverty and marginalization of the communities. That generates a sense of social injustice, as it, as it always has, and finds political form. Strikingly, the election in last year in Zambia saw an alternation of power, an overturning of a government that had claimed to be pursuing a kind of resource nationalism that had uh, nationalized um, in problematic circumstances some of those mines, and yet Copper Belt residents, when having the opportunity to vote, rejected a government which they felt, I think in many respects, was in, uh, performing that task very inadequately and have chosen a different kind of political path. So I think that Copper Belt democracy in Zambia is in rude health, um, in its indisciplined form that it's always taken, challenging established political power, but still seeking to uh, um, achieve a kind of more thoroughgoing uh, liberation as it often has been. In Congo, um, I think there are reasons to be optimistic from a very low point. Things have been extremely difficult. The region has been marginalized for much of Congolese uh, independence. Um, but there is uh, there are signs under the presidency of Tshisekedi of reform of some of the worst aspects of the mining uh, agreements uh, signed in problematic circumstances by previous governments. And I think some sense that the region can begin to see a kind of stabilization of politics, not through trade unions, but at least through local political leaders that has some potential to uh, give voice to that grievance that arises from the vast mineral wealth alongside ongoing poverty and historically ethnic conflict. So very dynamic, but very different on the two sides of the border. Thank you very much. Patience, I have a question for you, but would you like to add anything to Miles's point or shall I move on? I think you can move on. I, 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 have, I have a question <laughs> from Duncan Money. Um, a question for you about the mining boom of the copper belt in the 2010s and if and how this has changed the situation you describe. Do memories of harsh years of the 1990s and 2000s shape people's reactions to the boom? Uh, thanks, Duncan. I think it, uh, it, it varies. It's an intergenerational uh, question. So for um, older generations, i.e. prior to the, to the 90s and all, who sort of remember sort of much more the sort of, uh, even though not evenly applied uh, welfare, state welfare or industrial welfare um, system, they are much more, how do you put it? they are much more attuned to the idea that a boom 
uh, will not, uh, may not last and effectively have organized multiple strategies in which to sort of, even though they might not be able to sort of plan coherently, but to be able to sort of see for the, for the future in a way, you know, continue doing everyday activities to, to get by. For the younger generations, um, I think it's interesting to, to be able to sort of follow up in a number of years, but there was a moment actually, I, I think also quite characteristic of the copper belt of sort of high living and uh, really quite high, high living and quite spe spectacular form. And, um, and whether the crisis now uh, shifts those perspectives, particularly within sort of current political climate, is, uh, is, is, is yet to be seen. They have not been, they didn't grow up within the sort of ZCCM era, but they have the parents' memories. So an intergenerational perspective, I think, colors uh, people's engagement. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to follow that up with a second question for you, uh, Patience, because it feeds um, very much, very nicely on what you've just said, which is from uh, Angela Marula Selstrom here at the Institute. And she's asking about the theorization of trying um, and how you've incorporated this into your book. Could it also be used for, for other, as a concept, for other contexts, such, about, such as talking about resilience and people's recovery, when you're actually putting the focus elsewhere on another topic? Mm -hmm. no, thanks. I, I think one could engage, what one, one could relate to it, to those other settings. I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with resilience. To, to, to some extent, because it presumes that uh, difficult situations can go on and people will adapt. And so when I, when the way I use, um, the way I engage with trying is also to sort of describe its effortful sides and also the sort of hard part of it that people do fall off people do pass on and it can be applied in a way i guess to sort of if one looks at uh you know struggles around colonialism you know and you know anti-colonial struggles and all it, it takes into account also the people who've fallen by the wayside in these particular struggles but it does not stop them going forward so in a way it's a it's a resilience that goes if one has to use the word that is ever moving mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Patience. And a question from Angela, which sits very nicely on the shoulders of a historian, Miles, who has a comparative optic on the region. Um, it's fascinating to consider how engagements with racism and colonialism differed and led to very types of expression, engagement and nationalism in the Fort Katanga and Zambian Copper Belt. What explains these differences? Well, Angela, you'll have to read the book to get the full answer to that question. Um, but um, I, th I think I'll just draw out one particular point that, that Karen identified. Um, in the colonial context, the early proactive provision by the mine companies there of housing, social services, maternity services from as early as the 1930s, but quite a strong sense of company provision of welfare in this authoritarian paternalist framework creates an idea, I think, among Katangi's mine workers that companies are relatively beneficent and that cooperation with companies uh, enables mine workers' families to achieve a significant gain. In the Zambian Copper Belt, in the uh, colonial period, um, workers put simply have to fight for everything they get. They fight for those resources, they are grudgingly conceded by companies and states, and so you get you get a similar kind of social provision, an urban um, welfare kind of provision, housing and so on in both mining regions, but the way in which people think about it is very different. It creates, as Karen nicely emphasized, a kind of labor progressive uh, socialistic tradition of sorts in the Zambian Copper Belt and a much more passive um, paternalistic culture that then informs Katangese politics. That's not to say that that makes those things rigid, that then evolves over generations in different forms uh, intersecting with nationalism, national independence, nationalization, economic growth and decline. But I think that that, that creates one aspect of how social meaning is created by economic and political context, but also by how these communities construct their own understanding of self. So that's one of the ways in which 
I think, distinct experiences of racism and colonialism in the Belgian Congo and in Northern Rhodesia then come to unfold in new forms in the post-colonial period. I hope that addresses the question. <laughs> Thank you. So read the book. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean. I, uh, Miles. I have a question here, which actually I might uh, turn to our discussants uh, who might like to also make a reflection. Stephen mentioned the role of the capitalist hero in Detroit and in the Copper Belt area. On that note, has the myth of self-made entrepreneur, hero and motiva motivation and thus fruitful influ influence on Copper Belt society, or does it rather provide a way for the state to ignore its responsibility for infrastructure, social security, working conditions? Maybe you'd like to reflect on the copper belt, but I wondered if you would also like to add something at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'll leave the copper belt to, to these guys, but, um, but but certainly, I mean, about like Detroit. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and this is a, you know, as the, the state goes away and, and in Detroit, like, you know, coming out of the, um, you know, like the, the largest municipal bankruptcy in American history not so long ago, um, you know, the, 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 there's just no sort of like resources like there to to provide you know simple things for like you know plowing the snow or uh you know picking up trash off in like you know like uh, making sidewalks that are passable and not completely overgrown and so people are just supposed to you know solve these things on the, on their on their own and i think it is a way you know creating sort of this image of yeah well you know like the, the yeah you you must um you know take control and be self-sufficient and do things is a way to to kind of sidestep this the, the the fact that the state is no longer you know the 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 idea of um you know like a common good that's um uh you know in in, in the provision of a of, of, of public infrastructure that's available to everybody um you know it, it yeah well that's that's not possible in, in in really sort of even desirable anymore. So um, you know, so we can tell like these you know like these stories instead, and to make it part of just like a normal sort of a way to sort of normalize um, like these kind of duties that the the state sort of uh, retreats. And of course, in the in the U.S. context, like there's like a much longer story about um, about these about these sort of narratives about people sort of, you know, sort of going it own. I mean, that goes back to the to the to the frontier time. So you don't have to, we don't have to get into that here. But but I think, you know, certainly I think in the answer to this question, like yes, this is a way to sort of I, I think massage the fact that the state is in retreat, um, you know, and, and and is no longer able to kind of fulfill things that, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago we might have just taken for granted. Karen, do you have any observations on on uh, in, in, in fact I, I could ask a a question that uh, 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 you also uh, touched on this. It is the matter of sort of the the boom and bust, the uh, circulation. Uh, we get around again now. We retry and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and our uh, our uh, lack of. Uh, 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 some sort of social science tools to to really uh, get at this. Now you're talking trying, uh, you're saying living for the city, and uh, what we have is a whole lot of things at the same time uh, uh, compared to uh, one uh, uh, compared to when in the past uh, we had nice linear narratives that had sort of some sort some sort of closure. So to to be a little bit uh, facetious, if that's the right word, how long can we? How long can we uh, operate in the G1, living, trying? Uh, how are we to think of the next? Right? Is it just going round and round or different rounds? Now, uh, on and on. I, I think we. I, I mean, if if you are a rigid social scientific mind, you you want some sort of closure, and and this is just everything thrown in at the same time. Everybody now, multiple actors, this, that, this, that, you know, all kinds of strategies, uh, everything uh, at the same time. It's not one or the other, it's there always. Uh, it, it's messy. So, so, so let, 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 let me say I am a, I am a, a, a senior, a retired scholar. I can ask an ask a question. Like that. <laughs> I, 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 maybe in, maybe in my time, maybe in my time, I want some nice closure to this other than, you know, oh, there goes the cover again. Oh my. Uh, 
<laughs> I, I, so brief, a, a brief uh, response is that I think that sort of books such as they used to be order should be seen as an account of a particular political moment. I thought of this as a very particular historical moment, and I wanted also to ask Duncan's question. Uh, yes. I mean, there has been other times than news. Yes, it's a particular moment. And the reason why I wanted to write it is that there is a tendency, particularly in studies of African, the sort of structural adjustment process, not to write an account, despite that it was quite widely implemented across the Copper Belt, not to write that particular account. It sort of disappeared. And it's sort of written in sort of these sort of very policy circles. And it comes up in a few studies, such as yours, yes. Keeping Housing. And you in write Africa. about it too, yes. 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 Yeah. And it, it comes up in a few, but actually there's been a very, very sort of small account. And as a social scientist, one wants to sort of capture, in a sense, mm -hmm. be able to capture a particular uh, moment because one can't tell the full story. The full story, no, in no, a way. No, I so know that very well, yeah, yes, but, uh, but I just thought it was interesting. I mean, in that sense, your books uh, have much in common. Uh, right. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Thank and, you very much. That's a okay. very nice <laughs> note to, to, to end on. We've read right. out of time. It's a particular moment. The books have much in common, but also <laughs> much different. They speak beautifully to one another. I'd like on that note to thank our discussants very much, Steve and Karen, and also our authors. If you haven't read the book, books, please read them. I, they're really uh, lovely, uh, scholarly, rich accounts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>